On today's Visual Studio Toolbox, Scott Hunter recaps all of the amazing things the .NET team showed at Build. Hi, welcome to Visual Studio Toolbox. I'm your host, and joining me today is Scott Hunter. Hey, Scott. How's it going, man? Great. Thanks for coming on the show. I'm super excited to be here. It's right after Build. I know. I know you've been pretty busy with Build. There were a lot of things that were announced, but I thought we would do in this show is kind of review what you guys said at Build, what you shipped, what you announced, and then we'll spend time talking about what it all means. Um, we'll give people pointers to the videos and the demos. You and Scott Hanselman did um, a great 30-minute video and a really great hour-long video that we'll show people, uh, we'll have pointers to. Everybody should go watch that. Um, and then what I really want to do is kind of go a little bit more high level and figure out what it all means, what you guys are thinking, what we as .NET developers can look forward to coming down the pike. Um, and we'll do that all in a reasonably short period of time. Cool. All right. So let's do, let's start off with a recap of build. Yeah, let's, let's show a couple of the slides that uh, I had it build. Um, let me share. Okay, we you know we we always start off talking about you know Robert when you probably started using .NET you probably remember we used to only have desktop and web. I do. And then over the years we've had well. cloud, mobile, gaming, IoT, AI. You know .NET's grown a ton. People always ask me when they see me you know it's like well you know .NET's been around eighteen years. How is .NET doing? Um, and so you know we've added a million five uh, .NET Core developers. We shipped .NET Core in, in uh, March of twenty seventeen. That's when the tools showed up in Visual Studio. Uh, so it's only been about three years, a little, little more than three years. Um, Stack Overflow just ranked us uh, in their 2020 developer survey as the most loved web framework and the most loved other framework. That was both ASNet Core and .NET Core. Mm -hmm. um, for a project that open sourced in 2014, uh, we are one of the fastest, uh, highest velocity projects uh, in GitHub. Um, uh, our uh, C-sharp is the number five language in GitHub. Uh, we're seven times faster than Node.js and this Tekkenbauer benchmark, a public benchmark that we work on. And a lot of the people that are using our tools are brand new. We have 40% of our, our net new developers are students. And not only is ASP.NET Core seven times faster than Node.js, but it appears to be dramatically faster than ASP.NET uh, based on the full framework. That is, that is true. Um, there's a variety of reasons that, that come to that. When we built ASP.NET uh, web forms, uh, the version of ASP.NET System Web that's in .NET Framework, um, we tried to maintain the most compatibility we could with classic ASP uh, or ASP server pages is what they were called at the time. And so what we did is we took all the objects from ASP.NET um, or ASP server pages and we cloned them into ASP.NET. Um, and what this means is every request that comes in uh, to System Web um, allocates all of those objects, which end up being uh, upwards of 20 or 30K per request. Um, if you look at something like .NET Core, um, it allocates on the order of one or two K per request. And so there's a 28K difference in the amount of memory used. And what, we, what you find as a developer is the less memory you allocate, the faster you go. Yeah. Talk about adoption. Um, so once again, I, I just said earlier, we're 18 years into this thing. Um, and last year, we added over a million brand new .NET developers. Um, never used the tool before. Um, and I think that 18 years into the life of a, of a framework, that's a, that's a great number. Yeah, it's um, amazing. Of those, you know, 600,000 of those were .NET Core developers. Um, so you see that momentum happening around our open source, cross-platform, uh, lightweight version of .NET. Um, and, and then the crazy thing is, you know, we one of the visions of .NET Core was to run on Linux because we saw uh, the, the world of servers moving to the Linux platform in containers and stuff like that. And so we saw um, over a million uh, developers use our tool, our tool chain to actually output a Linux uh, publish um, from that, uh, which is amazing to think that, you know, we were uh, Windows only tech in 2014. Um, and in 2019, we have over a million publishes, uh, not necessarily to the cloud, but at least to your local machine, which you could copy somewhere. 
Right. Um, and then this is, you know, Robert, you're so familiar with this. You know, as we ship .NET over the years, whether it was 1.0 or 1.1, 2.0, uh, 3.0, 3.5, 4, 4.5, um, most of our developers took years to move from one .NET to the next .NET. Um, you know, it, when I when I first joined Microsoft, I struggled with this. It's like, man, it takes forever to to get the customer on the new version. With .NET Core 3, 75% um, of all of our customers had at least tried the new version within the first uh, six weeks of shipping mm -hmm. it, which is, you know, that's never been done before for us. So that's uh, super exciting. Now, let's talk about some of the new stuff that we announced at Build. We, we had two things that we announced at Build. We, sh we shipped Visual Studio 16.6, uh, which is the new version that supports some of these new features. Um, and that's the stuff you can try right now. And then after that, we're going to talk about some of the some of the stuff that goes beyond that. First off, um, we shipped a new product in uh, with .NET Core 3.0 in September of last year called Blazor. Um, and Blazor is some pretty cool tech. It's like if you go to you know modern websites, they all have what we call uh, what we call a spa, single page application. They feel kind of desktopy when you click around them. The whole screen doesn't redraw. They're they're very fluid. Um, and every app that you build with Blazor works that way, except normally those spy applications, you write them with the JavaScript framework like Angular or React or Vue, but now we let you actually write these apps fully in .NET. Um, C Sharp that can run on the client and C Sharp that can run on the server. Uh, at Build, we introduced Blazor WebAssembly, and this is a really cool uh, upgrade of the tech where we actually can run C Sharp inside of your browser. Um, and so why might you want to do that? Well, if, you're, if your C-sharp is running in the browser, um, it can take advantage of the CPU on the user's computer. It can run offline, meaning that you unplug the network or you're, you know, uh, we did a demo at, at Build where we were showing a, a, an app you might check in a car at a rental car uh, facility. Mm -hmm. And maybe sometimes it can't find the internet. Well, because the C-sharp is running in the browser, it can keep running and storing stuff in local storage. And then when the network comes back up, it can resynchronize to it. Um, when you build one of these Blazor WebAssembly apps, you get a checkbox to make it a progressive web app. And that's when the browser will say, hey, this app can actually run as a desktop app. You want to install it as a desktop. You click that box in, uh, in your browser, and then suddenly it'll show up on the start menu. Um, it'll run without the browser Chrome on it. It's super cool. And it's now available in the .NET Core 3.1 SDK. Um, we also announced that uh, .NET Core 3 uh, came out with WinForms and, and WPF support. Even today, um, we still have millions of developers building desktop apps because these frameworks are super fast and, and easy to build. Um, but we've been trying to catch up on the tool side of this, and um, we shipped 16.6 at build. But with 16.6 also, also came the previews of 16.7. Um, and preview 1 of 16.7 available now. Uh, these, these can run side by side, um, is close to having all of the controls in the WinForm Designer available for you to use. Um, and once we ship 16.7 Preview 2, uh, then we'll work, work on third-party controls. But as a WinForm developer, it's going to be easier to move from .NET Framework to .NET Core because you get that same designer support that you, uh, you expected. Okay. And then finally, the last big announce at Build uh, is uh, we shipped a framework called uh, ML.NET about a year ago. Um, and you know, it's a it's a it's a .NET framework for um, building machine learning. Now, it it it, it uh, you know machine learning is, is complicated. Uh, examples of ML.NET you might be using today that you're not aware of is if you have a a, a device that, that supports Windows Hello, that's where you can look at the screen, uh, or the camera, and it'll sign you in. That's using ML.NET. If you're using PowerPoint and it suggests some styles to you, that's ML.NET. Mm. Um, but you know, our job in in Visual Studio is to make your life as a developer easier. And so what we've done here is uh, we have a tool inside of Visual Studio where you can actually go click the, the machine learning kind of thing you want to do. We'll walk you through a wizard asking for images or text or whatever, um, and then we'll actually build a model for you and then inject the source code uh, to consume that model directly into your application without you having to know a lot about machine learning. And so we think yeah. this is a super exciting direction. That's cool. It seems like it does the possibility of hiding a lot of the plumbing that you might eventually want to learn, but to just get started, it'd be nice to not have to figure that out first. Exactly. Um, 
And then we, we, we kind of go off the rails here a little bit and we talk about, this was a dream of mine. Uh, I joined Microsoft in 2007 uh, and a bunch of my colleagues, Phil Hack, Scott Hanselman, Damien Edwards, we all talked about this notion of .NET at that, at that point in time was kind of fragmented. There was Silverlight, there was Windows Phone, there was Compact Framework, uh, there was Mono for Xamarin, mm -hmm. um, and could we get .NET back to a simple simple platform? And we started with .NET Core, um, but now that we've shipped .NET Core 3, um, we, we kind of want to drop that core moniker and switch to .NET 5. Um, and so the idea here is, let's take the best parts of, of .NET Framework, .NET Core, and Mono. And when I say the best parts, I mean, if you were going to build a brand new app today, you know, we don't want to go take the oldest tech uh, from .NET Framework and, and move it in. We want to take the modern tech you would use building a brand new application. So right. while .NET might have, might have had .NET remoting, uh, today we think gRPC is a much better solution. So uh, we'd only bring it over. We take the best of both those three frameworks, we merge them together, um, and that becomes .NET 5. Um, and this will ship this November. It has a single SDK um, that can build all of those app types. Um, it's got a single BCL. I mentioned before, Mono and .NET, uh, Core and .NET. We want to have just one base class library that stands for that's where your strings and date times and a lot of the types you use are. And with .NET Core, we introduced this new ability to say .NET new run. We want all that to actually you know, be for all the app types. We want to have awesome support for cross-platform native UI. If you want to build apps using native controls uh, that run on Windows, Mac, Linux, uh, iOS, Android, we'd love to do that. We want to have awesome cross-platform web UI, and I showed some of that today with the Blazor stuff that we talked about. Um, we want to have, you know, everybody's heard these terms, and you know, I'm sure you've heard it a million times, Robert. Containers, Kubernetes, microservices, uh, Docker. Uh, we want .NET to be awesome in, in that space. Um, and then, of course, we always want to make it better in size and speed and diagnostics and stuff like that. And so, we we really think at the end of this wave of .NET 5 and .NET 6 that we're going to have the best breed solutions for all those different workloads. Well, the one .NET really appeals to me because you wind right now, you know, there are three things. There's .NET Framework, there's .NET Core, there's Xamarin running on Mono, and there might be something that you want to use in an app, and then you discover that the version of the, of the framework you're using doesn't support that, right? So I wanted to use async main in a Xamarin app and it's possible I couldn't find it, but I think it's because Mono doesn't support it. <laughs> and, that, and I'm not going to admit how much time I spent messing around with it until it suddenly occurred to me, oh, this just isn't supported. Time to move on. Yeah, that's one of our goals is, to, is and we hope that's going to happen with this, with this transition is we break those seams down. So you get exactly the same features for every one of those app types, whether it's a desktop app, a cloud app, a mobile app, an IoT app, uh, you know, a gaming app, the exact same feature set across every single thing, the exact same tool chain. Um, I think it will really help the platform. And, and uh, we're going to do something else cool as part of this too that, that I think is exciting. Uh, when I say single SDK, one of the one of the dings that .NET Framework sometimes gets is it's big. You know, it's got a mm -hmm. lot of stuff. Um, we want to make even the SDK modular, which means when I install the, the .NET 6, um, SDK, um, all I'll get by default is going to be class library and console apps. Um, I'm not going to give you desktop or ASP.NET or uh, uh, mobile unless you ask for it. So imagine having a really, really tiny lightweight SDK and then you do something like .NET add mobile or .NET mm -hmm. add web. Um, I think that's, that's going to be cool too. And we, we want to open that up to the third parties as well. So um, third party libraries can actually do .NET add their library. Uh, and they can use the same features that we're using to to compose our own framework. Right. Um, this is a, a a big area of stuff that we talked about at at a uh, build, and um, you know Windows has some really cool new features that just came out. A new version of Windows just came out about a week ago as well, um, and that is the uh, Windows uh, 10 uh, 2004, and it supports something called WSL. Uh, WSL stands for the Windows Subsystem for Linux. And it lets you actually run Linux native on your on your Windows machine. Um, this is cool for a .NET developer because 
I can actually do uh, build a microservice and maybe my target is actually gonna be Linux. I'm gonna run it on a Linux server in the cloud. Um, I can develop locally in Visual Studio and control F5 and F5 directly into Linux um, just as fast and natively as I could run it on Windows on that same machine. Um, always trying to make microservices smaller. Uh, so in this case, I can I, I showed a demo where I took a, a microservice that was 45 megs in, in .NET Core 3 and in .NET 5, it was 17 megs. Cool. Um, and then probably the coolest thing on, on this list of things here is um, we've all built, I'm sure you've done this, Robert, you, you need to have a, a, a .NET app and maybe it's got a front end app, maybe, uh, that, maybe it's a web front end and it's got a back end app that's a, an ASP.NET Web API. Um, maybe it even needs a SQL server. Um, getting getting Visual Studio Toolchain to like launch all those the right way and, and swap the ports between them is all complicated. And so we have this new thing called Ty. Um, and with Ty, I can literally do run run the app one time, and we'll run all the apps. Um, and those apps can be either uh, .NET apps or they can be containers. Um, but you don't have to write Docker files or any of that stuff. You just say, I want to run this image, uh, and we'll go and do all the, the heavy lifting for you. And that's that's kind of our investment in the in the in the microservice space. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is something that you and I've talked about uh, before this, Robert. And this is uh, cross-platform native apps. Yes. Um, this is an exciting thing. Uh, we, we're kind of introducing .NET multi-platform app UI. That's a mouthful. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're going to abbreviate that abbreviate that down to .NET Maui. And obviously, .NET Maui runs on the .NET platform. And what it gives you is it gives you cross-platform native UI. Um, so against all those, those targets, it'll do Windows, Mac, uh, iOS, and Android. Uh, hopefully, we can do Linux as well. It's, it's, this is one of the coolest aspects. If you've ever used a Xamarin project, um, they're kind of complicated. They have a project for each of the platforms. So you have an, an Android project, and an iOS project, and a Windows project, and a shared class library. In this case, it's one single project. Um, one single code base to build all those targets. Um, from that single project, you can just right click and say deploy. And from that deploy, you'll get a list of all the app, uh, all the all the devices that you might want to deploy to, and they'll just run. Uh, one of the things that I showed Robert a couple months ago uh, is one of my favorite features is it's a it's a feature we've added to Xamarin, where I can basically take a Windows PC, plug an iPhone into the Windows PC, and run my app on the iPhone. Yeah. I, I don't have to have a Mac or uh, any special things. I can do it all with a free developer account from Apple. Um, and so for the first time ever, you can actually, you know, build and deploy, uh, you know, for your own testing apps directly from Windows to your iPhone. Yep. And this tech is actually just an evolution of Xamarin Forms. I, I like to think that this is the the next gen of Xamarin Forms where you take, take in uh, what was kind of successful and then made it easier to use with the single SDK, the single projects, the run on multiple multiple devices. Something else I should call out here is because we can run on those multiple devices, um, I can now build the app locally with no emulators because I can just run it on Windows. Or on my Mac, I can build it locally and run it on the Mac, which means I don't have to wait for that, you know, the slower emulator to actually work to, to get that app to, to run. Um, the, the .NET MAUI is going to actually be in as, as they're calling the the one .NET is a .NET five slash .NET six wave. Um, we'll have previews of .NET, uh, Maui, .NET Maui out in, with .NET six uh, towards the RC of .NET five later this year, and this is you know awesome native uh, UI. One more thing I want to talk about in, in this space, Robert, is you know you might you might about to, about to ask me <laughs> what what about UWP. <clears throat> A lot of customers have asked us, well, what's, what are we doing with UWP? Um, yeah, because the Windows guys announced uh, and we're talking about WinUI 3, and then I've heard the, about their plans for WinUI 4 and beyond. So WinUI 3, I think, targets .NET 5, and then they're talking about WinUI 4 as being the UI that would be native cross-platform. Exactly. <laughs> um, and so a lot of customers have asked us, hey, you know, when with .NET Core 3, where was where was UWP? Um, and Robert just nailed it. Um, the Windows team was already working on something called WinUI 3. Um, and this is basically an evolution of UWP. 
Um, it, it kind of gives the developer more choices. U UWP required your app to run in a, in a kind of a contained environment, a, a container, which gave it, it had security uh, constraints. If you wanted to go like touch the file system, that was hard to do. Um, uh, UWP um, had different features depending on the version of Windows 10 you ran on. Um, and WinUI 3 is very similar to .NET Core where um, we sh they ship the actual framework with your application, which means it works on all the versions of Windows 10. Um, and, and then as Robert said, it supports both .NET 5 and C++. Um, and the cool thing is, as you said, Robert, if they get to the point uh, when there's a WinUI 4 that actually works on all those platforms, maybe even .NET MAUI uses WinUI 4 as its, as its back end. We don't know that yet. That's, you know, we have to wait and see where things ship. Um, but that's in a- In addition a, to, or instead of Xamarin Form XAML? Well, remember, um, uh, let, me, let me step back a second. So, you know, Xamarin Forms today, what Xamarin Forms does today is it actually uses a variety of different tags. So if you're on iOS, it's using uh, the, the frameworks on iOS. If you're using Android, it's using the frameworks for Android. If you're using <clears throat> Windows today with, with, with a Xamarin application, it's using UWP as its implementation. So for all the platforms that, that uh, Xamarin runs on or .NET MAUI, .NET MAUI in the future will run on, we use whatever the best native tech is for that platform to, to render the controls. So when you write a button, Right. Uh, you know, it's a Windows button on Windows. It's an iOS button on, on iOS. It's an Android button on Android. Um, and so the .NET MAUI apps can use, uh, th that's that's the rendering platform. I think you were asking a question, what about the XAML that you actually use? Yeah, your, that's true. There's um, a distinction. Yeah, separate those two things a little bit. Okay. Um, when it, when it, so as when the it, set of native controls, that's what you were saying MAUI would use. Yes. Um, moving forward. Then there's the question of what do you use to lay out the at design time? Is it XAML or does it wind up being something entirely different? So it was a great conversation with Scott. We then went on to talk for another 20 minutes, so we decided to split the episodes in half. Please join us for part two, where we talk about what this all means for developers.